Whodunits are complex, plot-driven detective stories wherein who committed a crime is the main focus of the mystery. Clues are provided throughout the story which allows the viewer or reader to actively participate in solving the case. The identity of the perpetrator is commonly revealed at the end of the story. A how done it, on the other hand, refers to how a crime happened and the mystery surrounding that. Who Done It was first coined by Donald Gordon in 1930 during his review of Millwood Kennedy's detective story Half Mast Murder. The genre thrived during the golden age of detective fiction between World War II and World War I. British authors were the best known writers such as Agatha Christie, Nicholas Blake, and Dorothy Sayers, to name a few. Unlike many other forms of writing, during this period it was mostly female dominated. In 1947, the first and arguably most well-known crime mystery board game, Cluedo or Clue in North America, was first released. There are even live-action events such as mystery dinner parties, city-wide detective events and some escape rooms revolving around the whodunit genre. Newer iterations of whodunits have been told through YouTube series, movies and TV shows. But how successful are some of these in understanding the genre and using its elements to create a good story? A general story has a beginning that establishes setting and characters, a middle wherein a conflict or goal occurs, and an end that resolves the conflict or the goal is completed. Whodunits intend to skew this formula slightly to involve the reader or watcher in a manner that allows them to solve the mystery as they experience it, rather than simply observing a narrative. This means that certain rules of sorts must be followed. First, there must be an initially unaware protagonist slash protagonists to serve as an audience surrogate. This does not always have to be a detective, but must have a primary goal to unveil the identity of the perpetrator slash solve the case. It is more effective if the main character has a connection either to the target or have a personal reason to seek justice for them to generate audience empathy. On the other hand, the perpetrator or antagonist must have a believable motive and they must believe that their actions are justifiable from their perspective. Unless the story is supernaturally based, pure evil isn't a compelling enough explanation and will break the immersion. They must also be mentally and or physically able to commit the crime for the same reason. It's important that the antagonist is introduced as soon as possible, as the tension is built based off knowing the person slash people responsible is slash are already known. Next, the historical context and science must be accurate. Time and place can influence the motives of the characters, as well as the methods used to commit the crime by the perpetrator and methods used to solve it by the protagonist. Clues are an integral part of whodunits. You can casually plant these about, but don't make it obvious. We don't want it to be obvious that the perpetrator is who they are right away. You don't need to have multiple clues. One or two is okay, but there must be clues. Plotting backward is a very important part that you can do in order to methodically place clues. And you can walk in the antagonist steps backwards, therefore being able to see logically what happened and when. And the last and final part is do not cheat the audience. The entire point of a whodunit mystery is to involve your audience within the solving of the crime. There can be twists and turns that shock the audience, but upon looking back at the mystery as a whole, there must be clues and hints that indicate that this was going to be the outcome of the entire mystery. An example of a really well done whodunit is literally anything written by Agatha Christie. The woman, as far as I'm concerned, is genius, and anyone who disagrees with me, you're wrong, I'm sorry. But I want to go through three specific examples of a whodunit mystery and see how well they did in actually writing one. For the first example, I want to look at the very first episode of Sherlock, written by the BBC. A Study in Pink is a very good mystery, and for the following reasons. The protagonist is Sherlock. He has a goal which is part of his personal needs. It's his job, but also he wishes to validate his superiority in regards to being intelligent, and he gets adrenaline rushes from being right. The antagonist, Jeff, has a believable motive. 
His kids need money and he's going to die of an aneurysm anyway. He thinks that he's justified due to it being a game of chance, as he puts it. Playing a game of 50-50. He's not actually doing the ending of a life, he's having them do it themselves. Which, in his mind, from his perspective, is justifiable, considering that he's also getting money for this, which will go to his children that need money. Due to his warped perception of morality, he is 100% mentally capable of doing this and is physically capable of doing this because the only physical aspect he needs to have is being able to drive. The science is also accurate because GPS and phones exist in the present day, therefore they can be used to help solve the case. And poison is also available, so everything in a historical and scientific aspect is met. The clues, as well as Jeff's existence, are hinted at throughout the entire story. There are constant references to taxis and who would be able to hunt in a crowd. Meaning there are clues present for the audience to pick up on, but they're used sparingly enough for the twist to be effective and enjoyable. Plotting backward, I don't know if they use this, but considering that we start the story at the fourth target, the fourth victim, it's likely that they would have planned backward in order to see exactly what Jeff's moves were which is good, and the audience were not cheated. When you go back and watch the episode again, you can go, oh, I understand now. There are constant references to taxis, and the only mistake made by Sherlock is that he was looking at the passenger and not the driver, and therefore this episode was a good example of a whodunit. I know there's controversy about the finale of the Sherlock series because there absolutely were no clues and the audience was 100% cheated, but we're not going to talk about that today. The next example I want to talk about is Escape the Night, the first season with Joey Crisefa. The protagonists are kind of genius in this case because they're personable. They don't necessarily have to have the goal to identify a perpetrator or solve the case because these are public figures that many people have known over the years and therefore the audience already have empathy for them, which is good. As well as this, they do have to sort of solve cases as they go because they have to get out of the house. That is their goal. So while it's not their primary motive, it is a motive that comes along with having to get out of the house. The antagonist, the butler, Arthur, is very much a signature whodunit move. The butler did it. And I don't mind that. I do kind of think that the supernatural element might have been a bit of a cop-out because his motive was evil. But again, it was very much enjoyable because he is, in fact, believing that he's justified because of this. He's mentally and physically capable of doing this and he's introduced right from the very first episode. I think it was a given that Sarah the maid had something to do with it because she was, she served them ahead so that was a given but Arthur was helping them along it seemed. It was very intriguing to have a twist like that especially because Vincent left the note that Ollie read saying that the one who is in league with the evil is among you and therefore a lot of people went straight to Sarah. What about Arthur though? I did kind of think that. They all work in the same house. They work together. Surely he knows something but he did know a lot about what was going on. Although there weren't many clues, which we'll go on to shortly, in regards to Arthur being the predominant antagonist, they were there. The historical and scientific aspects were followed. They didn't have access to modern technology, it made sense, and a lot of the methods used by the antagonist, they were believable, poison was available, and I guess supernatural beings don't necessarily have time constraints, so... It made sense to me, and the ways in which they went about solving the case were also readily available in the time period. I've already gone over some of the clues, but I'm just going to put them in this little section here. The clues were, Arthur knew a lot about what was going on. 
it's just the way that it was presented. It seemed like he was using his knowledge to help them. And that was the intriguing part, as well as the note that Vincent left, which was a red herring for Sarah. Although she was, in fact, involved, she wasn't the main person. She wasn't the main antagonist. So that was also quite interesting. I don't think plotting backward was necessarily used because as the story progressed, so did the mystery. But you could also see little flashbacks as to what was going on beforehand, which was very much well used to indicate what was going to happen in a particular episode. So I did enjoy that. And I don't think the audience was cheated. I think the audience was given enough clues that, yeah, Arthur knows a lot. But is he doing it for the right reasons, especially after the first ritual failed? That was a good clue. The last case is going to be the final season of Pretty Little Liars, which, as we all probably know at this point, was a load of crap. It was terrible, but I will explain to you from a whodunit perspective why it was terrible. The protagonists have a goal to solve who eventually offed Charlotte, but the only reason they do it is because they're being threatened. That's not a very good motive. They're not personally involved. I mean, they were involved with Charlotte. Charlotte put them through a lot in the dollhouse, but it isn't really a motive as to why they should help Charlotte post-mortem by finding the person responsible for her death. They kind of have to do it because they're made to. As for the antagonist, I can't even remember her name. That's how, 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 you know, memorable it was. What was it? I literally can't remember her name. Alex Drake. You see, AD, her initials, are pretty much the only clue we have towards her identity. And I knew the final villain was called AD, but I still couldn't remember her name because that's how much of an impact she had on me as a viewer. She too has a warped sense of morality and she's doing this because she wants to replace Spencer because Spencer had a better life than her. She's definitely mentally and physically capable, but we had no idea that this person existed until the last minute. Well, not the last minute of the show, but given that there are seven seasons, she's introduced right at the end. We don't know who this person is. There's absolutely no tension because it's none of the cast that we've come to know and love throughout the years. Who is Alex Drake? I couldn't tell you. There's this whole segments piece about her backstory and I couldn't care less because I don't know this character. The time and place makes sense but they didn't even use any of the technology available in historical context to figure out who the person was because there was no indication as to who it was. I mean there were theories online of, of twins for a long time because this show has a thing with twins but apart from that and AD there was no indication that this person is the person we should all be looking at nothing whatsoever and when she's introduced and takes Spencer's place there are like three things maybe that could indicate that this isn't Spencer Number one, she started a horse. Number two, may, was it in character to, like, have a hookup with Toby? That's not really a clue because they have a history together. The, the timing of it was a bit off. Maybe Spencer herself wouldn't do that, but it's not out of the realms of reality to not be legitimate. And number three, Jenna, a blind girl thinks that Spencer's not Spencer. So for the audience trying to figure out who this person is, there's barely any clues. There's nothing to indicate that this person actually exists and isn't within 
the group we already know. And number two, when the audience knows that this is an imposter of Spencer, there's still not enough clues for the cast to figure out, wait, this isn't Spencer. It fails in both departments. They have taken the clues segment of Who Done It far too literally because of course you only need one or two clues, that's fine and you shouldn't make it obvious. They've taken that far too literally. There has to be some kind of indication while the clue can't scream, this is the person because then it, there's no tension, you just know it's them. It also can't be somebody we don't know and haven't known throughout the entire season up to this point or throughout the entire show at this point because obviously there are links to Charlotte. They clearly didn't plot backward, they've even admitted that they didn't plot backward because they didn't know where the show was going. They just needed a twist to say, aha, audience, you didn't figure it out because... It's this thing you couldn't have possibly figured out unless you, I don't know, believe that twin theories have to be endgame, which isn't even necessarily indicated in Spencer's case whatsoever. And therefore, they also violated the very last part, which is do not cheat the audience. It ruins the fun. It ruins the experience for everybody. It's so stupid. Which is why the Mona and Cece slash Charlotte reveals were much more satisfying. Mona definitely. Cece was still kind of eh for a lot of people, but it worked. And let's quickly go through this list of rules in order to explain why. Of course, the protagonists remain the same. We know these people and they definitely have a motive to unveil this person and solve the case because they are being harassed and they are being threatened. And it, they aren't just being threatened to solve a thing for this person they don't know. It is directly affecting them in their everyday lives. They have a personal connection because this is all revolved around Alison in some way, shape or form. Mona as an antagonist worked. Her motive was a bit weak. Being bullied isn't necessarily a reason to go to this extent, especially because it was Alison that was the primary bully in this case. The girls were definitely complacent and enabled Alison. They didn't question her or stop her. But again, it maybe wasn't proportionate to what the girls had actually done for the response that Mona gave them. She's definitely mentally capable and physically capable of doing these things. And she is introduced uh, right from the get-go, right from the first episode, there's Mona. So it works. As for Charlotte slash Cece, sh her motive's a bit off. I mean, you know, she thought that the girls didn't miss Alison enough and she needed to hurt them because of that. It's a weak motive. She's obviously got some stuff going on, so she thinks that she's justified in that way. And she's definitely mentally and physically capable of doing these things. And to the writer's credit, she was introduced much earlier on and therefore was present. She wasn't as present as Mona, but she was around and she was known. But she wasn't part of the main cast. She wasn't part of their everyday lives. But she was introduced much earlier on than Alex Drake. But then again, every character was introduced much earlier on than Alex Drake. The historical context and the science were there. The technology was available. There is a discrepancy with Cece or Charlotte as to how exactly she managed to afford everything because it costs a lot of money to keep the dollhouse up and going. Think of the electrical bills for one. With Mona it makes a bit more sense. She is an only child and she does have an expensive taste with designer things so perhaps her parents just gave her more money because they don't have any other children to you know spend their money on so it makes sense as to why Mona has a bit more money, but Cece, she didn't really have a lot of support. I mean, she was institutionalised, which, you know, would have cost a fair bit of money. But apart from that, there's no indication that she was getting much more financial support than a normal person would from her parents. And she doesn't have a job. 
Maybe she managed to sweet talk Ren, who is a doctor, which pays well to get her a bit of money, but it's not going to be that much. How did she afford all of this stuff? Clues. Now, like I said before, clues don't have to be in every single episode even, or at every single turn. Of course, they have to be there to progress the plot along, but it doesn't have to be a, I found a clue and solved it in one episode. It could take time to manage to figure out how the clue is integral to the plot. It has been a little while since I have watched Pretty Little Liars, but I found this list of early clues that Mona was A, and it makes sense. And the first one is that Mona was very controlling about the aspects of the fashion show, but the fashion show was hacked and turned out terribly. And if Mona was in such tight control of this, how would that have happened? Which makes further sense when she has amazing hacking skills. Like, Mona was capable in hacking the principal's computer and didn't make it seem like a big deal. Mona's good at hacking, so the fact that a hacking occurred at a fashion show that she was in charge of makes a lot of sense. Another clue is that Mona seemed to be the only other person outside of the main cast that was receiving a text. So while Hannah, Spencer, Arya and Emily were getting a text, Mona would also get a text, but seemingly no one else in the school did. The targeting of Hannah definitely makes a lot of sense in retrospect. She seemed to get the worst of it. She was hit by a car. A managed to leave a message on her cast. And who was going to visit her aside from her friends, which included Mona. And Mona was the link to Hannah that was different to everybody else. She was friends with Hannah. And Hannah seemed to get the worst of it. For some reason... Mona is the common denominator in this case. And Mona and Alison were the only two people that actually knew about Hannah's ED. Those two. One is presumed dead. That leaves Mona. As for Cece, we do see Cece wearing a black hoodie, which is the signature A item. She is seen in a black hoodie. The next clue is Mona literally tells us that she passed on the A-game to Cece and Radley. When Cece came to Radley, I thought she was Ali. I don't remember what we talked about. That was before they changed my meds. And this was in season four, episode one, whereas we don't find out that Cece is A until season six. The next one is where she screws up by mentioning Hannah's shoplifting when she shouldn't have known about it, but of course she learnt because of the conversation with Mona at Radley. Then, in Season 4, Episode 7, Nigel reveals to Caleb and Toby that Cece organised a flight to the lodge. I will link the Tumblr post and the blog where I got these from, but honestly, Mona and Cece's clues do make you think upon a second watch. And it makes sense in a lot of different ways. While the motives might not be that great and maybe people were a little bit upset that it wasn't somebody in the main cast for Cece's reveal, it makes a hell of a lot more sense than Alex Drake when all we have to go off is twin theories and the accessories that Spencer wears. That's unfortunately all the time I have for this video, but in conclusion, I think that Sherlock, at least the first episode, was a very good and well done whodunit, as well as Escape the Night, although, again, I think evil is just a bit of a cop-out, it makes sense and there's enough there. And the Pretty Little Liars finale? Mmm does not make any sense and cheats the audience, whereas at least with Cece you could see it upon a second watch and you could pick up things that aren't as obscure as theories and what well, accessories Spencer's wearing. Hmm. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next Halloween. Bye!